Constructed Criticism is brought to you by our three amazing sponsors. Grey Viking Games, Oasis Games, and PureMDGO.com. You can find them directly in the links in the show notes and use the codes associated with each sponsor. We appreciate each of them and definitely think that you should check them out for all your Magic the Gathering needs. Now sit back and enjoy this week's episode of Constructed Criticism. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the 375th episode of Constructed Criticism. I am your Lycan host, Mason, joined by my internal nocturnal co-host, Abe. Abe, how you doing? I'm doing fantastic today, Mason. Uh, I'm glad you identify that I'm eternally nocturnal. Uh, it's rough when so much happens during the day. It's a real problem. But, Abe, I was thinking we might raise the day with our new permanent co-host zombie spencer spencer how you doing bud welcome back full time to cc uh we had you on two weeks ago and just with the way everything kind of worked out uh you're here again how's it feel uh feels really good i might may or may not have cried remembering that i was doing this cast like 30 minutes ago uh just kind of really excited i've gotten a lot of messages <laughs> from people and uh yeah i'm i it's it is something that I didn't think would ever happen again, um, but it kind of worked out, and I'm really excited to be back. So it's also episode 376 of Constructed Criticism. Oh, well then. The last episode on uh, Spotify was uploaded incorrectly, as I just double-checked that. Oh, well, well then, I'm, then I'm the idiot. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyways, who knows? It's the pick to set review episode. We had a standard rotation, so of course, classic CC fashion, we had to rotate our co-hosts. Sure. And so yeah. now, bam, we have Spencer. Uh, that's how it's going to be. When Eldrin, well, uh, when Zendikar leaves, who knows what's going to happen? Maybe Seth Manfield will be back. Who knows? We'll figure real, it out in the time. Real talk. When is rotation? Uh, so it depends on how you want to define it from a philosophical standpoint. For me, arena launch is the launch of a set, so it's in two days. Uh, otherwise, it's a week and two days, or a week and three days. So, you the know. paper lag is so real. Like that's just so insane to me. You know, it's it's especially really funny when you think that MTGO used to come out after the paper sets, <laughs> and now the <laughs> yeah. Also, tomorrow because of the God accounts, you actually get access to Zin uh, Innistrad Standard a day earlier than even Arena with Mitgo. Because you have access to all the cards, and all the cards are on the sets tomorrow. So uh, you actually have Eldrain plus Innistrad standard for tomorrow on uh, Magic Online, which is a pretty weird situation. <laughs> the the, uh, the Zoomer age of digital magic is upon us, folks. It is. <laughs> but, so what what, okay. what is a pick two set review? Glad you asked. So the pick two set review is the penultimate way to do a set review. So basically, uh, I'm sure a lot of you have listened to other Magic podcasts or other content, and there's like a top 10 list, right? And what happens is the content creator kind of goes on 10 through maybe 8, and they kind of say something along the lines of like, ah, oh, well, this card might make it, but not really, don't get your hopes up. And then they have to qualify all their picks until they really reach the top two. We want to circumvent that. So instead of having a top 10 list, instead we have four categories. And then we pick two cards per category. That way we can frame the cards in the correct light for you. And we have to talk about more cards that maybe wouldn't always get to hit. So our four categories are Sleeper, which are cards that people aren't really talking about that we think are going to be big players in the format. Favorites, cards that we think are personal favorites and we're really excited to play with. They might be great. They might be terrible. We kind of let you know in the time of that. Hopeful are cards that seem to be really, really close to being big hits in standard or modern or historic or format we let you know about at the time. And that's kind of a card that we're looking to see to break through. It might not make it. And then finally, we have the hits, which should be your number one or number two card in the set, in our opinion. And this is lets us go over some cards that maybe we wouldn't get to. And it gives you the frame of context and the mind of where we're at without you having to think about like, oh, what did they say at the start of this? You lose focus for a minute. You know what section we're in. And that way you can kind of get the idea of where our heads are at when we're talking about this. And it's just a really fun way to do the set review. Uh, and... We have three people today, so we're going to be covering a lot of different cards. I think we have only one card overlap between all of it, so it really says a lot, because this Innistrad set, I mean, it is very exciting. I don't know how you feel about it, Spencer. You know, you, you've been out of CC for a little bit. I know Abe and I have been a little lower on standard than you felt, but are you excited for the Innistrad drop? Yeah, I, I'm 
which is pretty. I I think that when people are excited about standard, uh, you know, at the beginning of the rotation, it's usually really fun. Like you get to see a lot of stuff. I mean, sometimes you have you know, Omnath doing Omnath stuff. Uh, but you know, outside of those moments between Oko and Omnath, like it's usually just a really good time. Yep, I agree 100. percent Abe, I know that for us, we were really big into standard about. 12 to 11 months ago, depending on the time, uh, with the SCGs and stuff. And we kind of fell off it with how, you know, scale the format got. And, you know, in a way, things changed in little minute ways. But sort of the big players kind of stayed there the whole time. Are you excited for Innistrad? And do you think it's, uh, you know, as hype as everyone's making it up to be? Oh, yeah. I I think this is going to be one of the, like, especially off the back of what we just came off of, which we discussed in an episode a couple weeks ago, like the last year of what, uh like magic's kind of looked like and how dominated it's been by this like almost like smothered by the the push of eldraine seeing something new come in and breathe life into the format and like giving a lot of the cards in the last year of even more of a chance to shine i'm just really excited for and and i think that not only are the innistrad cards really sweet and going to be awesome to play with but uh the the cards from the other sets that are going to be unlocked by way of not being held down by bone crusher giant and Ed Welding Keeper are going to be also fantastic to play with. So it's like Christmas. I don't know. It's the best. Yeah, that was one of the things, because that was the point I was really going to make, is I, I'm excited for Innistrad, and there's a lot of things that I'm really hyped about. It's my, my favorite plane to go to. I think they nail the lore and the power like every time. This one doesn't look to be different in that way. Uh, but I'm really excited about all the other kind of mid rangey cards that kind of got forced out. You know, the last year was really hostile to mid range between Ultimatum, the adventure cards, and, you know, Rogues in a way was so efficient that it was really hard to play something that maybe is a little clunkier than normal. Um, and I think that we have a real shot at a lot of cards being sort of un, like, unbanned or, you know, soft unlocked. And I'm super excited to look into those. And while we won't get to talk about those as much today, uh, you know, they kind of play a big part in some of these other cards. So it's going to be exciting to talk about. Well, I think we've kind of done enough preamble. Let's just hop straight into the set review itself since we have so many cards to go over. And I'll start things off with Sleeper. So just once again, Sleeper is kind of the spot where we feel people are not talking about this card enough. And we think it's going to be a big player. So if you want to contextualize in your head, these are would be like pretty high in a top 10 pick list for us. Uh, and they're just ones that no one's talking about. And we will be reading the cards for you today because we <laughs> there's a lot of cards. Luckily, you know, Abe, your first set review is Strixhaven. I kind of just gave you a reading comprehension test. It's not that bad this time, but it's pretty bad. But, you know, Spencer's a veteran. I'm sure he can handle it. Uh, the first card is Briar Bridge Tracker, which is two and a green creature human scout two three with vigilance. And when this creature enters the battlefield, you investigate. So if you haven't experienced that mechanic before, it's make a clue token. And a clue is you can spend two mana and sacrifice that token to draw one card. Then as long as you control a token, Briar Bridge Tracker gets plus two plus zero. So in a lot of ways, when Briar Bridge Tracker comes down, it is a three mana four three with vigilance. Um, that you know, you have the card draw later. And I think that while that's really, you know, kind of a strong card for an aggressive deck you could play in it, I think for like mid-range green based decks, this card really lets you in the early game kind of trade off with something aggressive, put pressure on the controlling players, and then have that card draw for later. And I think when it first forced first dropped, people immediately compared it to Tyler's Tracker. And you know, Tyler's Tracker made a clue every time you dropped a land, right? It was just this mid-range powerhouse. It was so hard to ever overcome a tireless tracker. Heaven forbid your land was an evolving wild, you know. That card was just going to take over the game. And while Briar Bridge Tracker doesn't do that, I think that's an unfair comparison. I think this is much more like a green Thraben Inspector. Uh, and Thraben Inspector saw play its entire life, despite Spencer hating it. And I'm so glad we get to bring you on for Thraben Inspector time again, Spencer. <laughs> have you and seen, I, I have you seen the new... Is, I was going to say, have you seen the new, better blue version of that card? The O3? I I have seen the new. (laughs) Well, it's a 1-2 body. We'll get to it. We'll get to it. We'll get to it. (laughs) But, yeah, uh, I just think this card's super great. I'm curious what you two think about Briar Bridge Tracker before I talk about my next card. Yeah, this card card almost made um, my list on favorites. I, I think... I think that one of the things that's really interesting about this card that I hadn't really thought about a bunch was... Just the fact that it doesn't have to be a clue token. It can be any token you want. So it could be a treasure token. It could be, which, you know, we all know those are all over the place. It could be a food token if you're playing some, you know, uh, a format with those. Like, there, there's there's a lot uh, that could go on with this card. 
that isn't just um you know it isn't just this clue that it brings along for the ride um mason you said it before the show but like i had not thought about the fact that this cruise um chariot by itself and then you can actually copy your clue tokens um that's yeah, pretty sweet chariot and this card are best friends <laughs> like like the fact that the fact that this both gets its buff from the wolves and the chariot can uh you know, can can pump out more clues. That that is actually an interesting line um, for mid-range decks. Yeah, it, it's gonna be no. I'm gonna let you all in on a hint if you're a listener. Uh, I'm really big on the gruel colors in this combination, uh, or in, the, in this set, I should say. And I think that those cards are really strong. And there's a lot of cards from the past sets that well, some like a Seeker's Chariot saw play, but others that didn't quite see as much play. They're gonna really unlock these cards and. Yeah, Spencer, like you mentioned, Asika's Cherry and Briar Bridge Tracker, like peanut butter and jelly, those two are just so insanely strong. Abe, how do you feel about Briar Bridge Tracker? I think that Briar Bridge Tracker is like just a very like solid, like value kind of like mid range bridge the gap card that also is like, you know, a good aggressive like pressure card. The thing that stands out the most to me about this card was actually when I saw it was previewed on Twitter. I remember uh, Donald Smith Jr. tweeted that the like process for making this card was that they were testing and he was like, I just like really want another green three drop. What if I just did a card that did this? And it was just that text except without visual. And then they tested with it a bunch and played with it a bunch and they kept everything except for the fact that they were like, let's make it a little bit stronger, but not too much stronger. Just put vigilance on there and move on. And like the fact that it was a card that through the rigors of like so much change can happen when you're like designing a set and, uh, and you know, like, the cards around it change, but it was always a constant card that was deemed acceptable and maybe even a little too weak without vigilance to compete in the standard format really gives me a good feeling about this card. And like everything about it is just, you know, you get a solid rate creature, you get a card out of it later. Uh, it's like not super unaffordable uh, on, on your mana curve. I think it's just like a super solid design and a super solid card. Yep. My next card is Storm the Festival. So this is three green, green, green for a sorcery. You look at the top five cards of your library, and you may put two permanent cards with mana value five or less from among them onto the battlefield. Put the rest of the cards in the bottom of your library in a random order, and the spell has flashback for seven green, 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 so ten mana. Um, Storm the Festival, <laughs> it's funny. My two cards got compared to cards that... Uh, I think they're not as good as, but maybe a little unfair comparisons. It got compared to Collective Company immediately after being saw. You know, it's two mana more, you get to see less cards, and you only get one more mana value worth of stuff. And I believe that basically the trick to Storm the Festival is if, do you believe that Renin 7 is a good card? And as we'll talk about later today, I believe Renin 7 is a great card. And I believe that, plus the Seekers Chariot, Briar Bridge Tracker, this sort of stuff, you have a lot of really great things to hit off your Storm of the Festival. And it's so hard for your Storm of the Festival to actually miss in your green-based mid-range decks. I think this is just a great topping card that gives you a lot of play in the late game. And the fact that you hit lands, I think, matters a lot. The lands will come into play untapped, barring them having some sort of text that changes that. And I think Lotus Cobra is another card that's really primed to do great things in the standard format. And I just think that there's a lot of real power to this card. And I think while I wouldn't pay six mana to get two lands, I think there are a lot of things you can do with these colors where that's not actually the end of the world. And anytime you hit something like a Seekus Chariot Ren and Six and you like minus the Ren and Six and you get the token and now your Seekus Chariot's copying that, I think your opponents are in for a world of beating. And I think that sort of play pattern is actually pretty reasonable with this card. I, I This card kind of... It's funny because uh, it made me think of Command the Dread Horde, not Collected Company the first time. So... Is that the name of that card? The yeah, the yeah, one that uh, brings like the graveyard. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think that like, I think it's kind of fair to give it the collect company comparison because the way that you're going to have to build your deck with this in mind is pretty similar. Like, you're going to have to make sure that none of your like you don't have a huge density of things that aren't permanents that cost five or less. But I think a lot of people miss that permanents that cost five or less are a lot less restrictive than creatures that cost three or less. And while your payoff is a little lower because this is a sorcery, like the times where you get 10 mana out of stuff out of this card or even just the right five mana of stuff out of your six mana and like a land or something, those times are going to be so good. And, and this can just be the top end of like a lot of green mid-range strategies. The question that I might have is like, will there be enough of a need for like non-permanent things to be doing outside of Storm the Festival that like, 
that becomes a bit of a, a deck building constraint but like uh you know like it, it's really powerful and i think people like think of all the six drops you've ever wanted to play and they're like all game ending on their own right it's like primeval titan coma like it, the standard environment hasn't really had those the farm has been decided by like i guess coma off of um like ultimatum, ultimatum but without without something that goes that far over the top this is a thing that like could just be ultimatum like in that you cast it and then you just get like two things that put you so far ahead of your opponent they, they're just on the back foot and it's that's actually kind of why it reminded me of of command for what it's worth because it has that kind of same like you know if this card resolves the the, the entire kind of like ultimatum actually yeah where like the whole game kind of shifts now like if we put in a planeswalker and you know a you know a four drop right like I mean, now now this entire battlefield has shifted into a planeswalker that matters and this giant thing to protect it, and you know that that very much is like uh, like an ultimatum. I mean, so yeah, yeah. I also think for its worth, it has a small chance for historic play. I think the Paradox Engine deck is the deck that really benefits the most from this. That deck has a lot of things that it needs, um, and a lot of things that are pretty big, and the things you're cheating in off it are very valuable from, you know, more Paradox Engines to Aether Flex Reservoirs to simply more Mana Rocks that, you know, will allow you to do that sort of stuff. And even hitting lands isn't that big a deal. And in that deck, generating the flashback will probably happen on the same or the next turn of uh, this card being there. So I think that's another place where this card actually has some real legs is in green-based combo decks. But I think those we're going to need a little bit more time to figure out exactly. Yeah, that deck's misses two are like pretty good right they have like a bunch of like prophetic prisms and like mind stones and stuff so like it's, it's hard to to miss hard if you hit just one of your pieces and that and uh yeah and then like a, a cantrip out of the other for for future reference by the way Ab, we refer to donald as former guest and friend of the show uh on oh this podcast. My, my bad <laughs> it's true it's true <laughs> no, former former uh guest and friend of the show donald <laughs> former right okay. sounds like he's deceased now former yeah. <laughs> to, anyway on to my sleepers um my first sleeper uh is hungry for more which is uh a sorcery for a black and a red that creates a 3-1 black and red vampire creature token with trample lifelink and haste and you sacrifice the token at the beginning of the next end step and it's flashback for one of black and a red. And this card is like, uh, it reminds me, and it's hard not to remind me of like Hellspark Elemental, which is a card that back when I started playing competitively was like a much bigger deal. And like those red deck wins decks had like a lot more reach um, than like usually we see red decks have now. Like we've kind of been defined by Embercleave and uh, like Torbran and not really so much Burn uh, for the last couple years. But this card, I think, with the right density of ways to, like, push direct damage in the early turns or just, you know, down the stretch, uh, giving you the time off of the life gain, being like a lightning helix your opponent for two mana with flashback, you have to, like, kind of maneuver the battlefield around a bit to be able to consistently get that. There are going to be matchups, like, against a blue white control deck where this is just going to be six damage from your opponent and you gain six life. And I think that that effect is really potent and powerful if the rest of it's supported. And so I don't know, you know, how the rest of standard's going to look. But I do know that, like, a card like this has a real home. And I feel like I haven't seen anyone, you know, consider the applications of having Hellspark Elemental back on the menu for a standard deck. Man, you're giving me flashbacks to, like, Hell's Thunder. And, like, that was that oh, was yeah. actually the first, <laughs> this is straight up the first uh, Tier 1 standard deck I ever owned. Um, so that's that's too funny. Yeah, I think that was the first deck I lost to at a Grand Prix. That's great. That's great. I have no idea what they're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's that ball you know, lightning for everything. He, so. here's, here's the thing. The best part about this card, by the way, is that it is also a forever mood. So, you know, when the, <laughs> when the name of a card is just true about you, you know, it's easy to identify with. And for you know, me... This card's going to get screenshot a lot for tweets. <laughs> <laughs> Seconds? Can I get seconds? <laughs> We've had our first loss of the day. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, yeah, there's too many puns puns for this one. I, I think that this card is... It's funny. It feels like this has a lot of sleepers, and I think that, that one of the reasons for that 
is because people have kind of one because we didn't really get a rotation because of Eldraine, uh, and then two, be, be to add on to that, people have kind of forgotten that like rotation can make a bunch of cards playable because the pool gets so small that like things aren't getting squeezed out as much unless there's like one broken thing. And I don't know. I think this card is just pretty good. And and like people are usually not hyped about pretty good cards. Um, which is kind of sad because like it's that's, well sad for constructive. I think that's not term limited. But anyway, I'm I'm rambling. So Mason, what do you think of the card? I think the card's quite good, and I think it does great groundwork too for setting up for the vampires. You know, we, here's the weird thing. All right, y'all, we have four episodes until we're doing our next set review. Just keep that in mind while we're recording this. We're four, we're four weeks away from Crimson Vow spoilers starting. And that set is the vampire set. <laughs> I broke Abe. Uh, and I, I think that the vampire stuff is already, we have some really strong cards in the set. And I think a red, black, aggressive deck looks really strong. Uh, and if, if it isn't good enough now, it's going to have the, you know, I think enough tools to be something to really look at the next set. And I think this card, along with Vampire Socialite, which I don't know how much digging y'all have done as a common from this set, that's basically Thalia's lieutenant for vampires, except instead of it getting bigger, it buffs the team every time. So it does the Thalia lieutenant thing, and then instead of buffing itself up, it goes wide again. So I think a card like that works really well with a card like this, and I think that sort of stuff is quite strong. And I, I just think Hunger for More has a real shot of being a just a totally good card. And, you know, it being a bolt at worst, right, is a really... Well, I guess uh, a lava spike at worst is a really hard place. A, to la- be a lava helix. That's true. Yeah, a lava you helix with flashback. Back. You know yeah, what I? You Lord know what I'm hung- hungry for though, Abe. Is your next sleeper? My next sleeper. You're not even gonna believe it's arcane infusion. All right, only the finest sleeper. Uh, it is a blue red instant that uh, you look at the top four cards of your library, you can reveal an instant or sorcery card from among them, put it in your hand, and the rest in the bottom of your library in a random order. It's kind of like a Narset minus on a blue-red instant, and it has flashback for uh, three, a blue, and a red. And I think that, like, while this effect isn't necessarily one that is very exciting on the surface, I think that because of specifically the dynamic with, um, like, how good expressive iteration is, and how good spell lands are from Zendikar, like the double face lands, you get to play this card to do a whole lot more than just find specifically instant or sorceries. It helps you hit your land drops, uh, like almost at the same rate that Impulse does. Uh, it can find key pieces to like, if you're playing a Jeskai control, that can need to find your Wrath of God or your Doom Scar per se. You know, you could just, you have a lot more looks at it. You can play fewer copies of your more niche effects. And I think it's just a, a card that really serves to be in a place to be a good role player, um, and especially around like being able to hit your land drops uh, with like Dwari Disruption or Shatter Skull Smashing or whatever spell lands you want to play. Uh, it's just, I think it's like, because it's competing with Expressive Iteration, it's kind of at like a little bit of a uh, little bit of shaky ground, but I think it has its own place and its own role. And uh, I don't like, know, is it competing with it? Like, like let's uh we'll get into this later in the podcast, but like I'm also gonna bring up cards that really are gonna benefit from the fact that we have these double faced spell lands. And you know, if you want four expressive iterations in your deck, it is extremely likely to me that you also want this card in your deck. Like I don't know that it's competing with it as much as it's like they want to be played together. Yeah. I mean competing in like the sense where it's it's hard to play four iteration in Oh, four. sure, sure, sure. But, but I do, th- and one of the big problems with iteration is that it's hard to play with, like, reactive spells and iteration unless you have a way to, like, make sure you're going to be casting iterations on turn four or five and be ahead to that to that point. But I think that Infusion is a card that you can, you know, if you need to leave up early interaction, uh, you know, is going to make it less punishing to you because you can cast this on turn two where you can't cast iteration on two. Uh, and then in the late game, you can, like, flash this back digging for more. Uh, even if, you know, maybe iteration is like it, iteration is almost like so good that it's hard to find more room to put like well, two mana draw effects in your deck. But I think this one's so good in conjunction that I think it's like kind of getting overlooked because of that. You did actually just make me think of the fact that like because if I get to play this and like you know other and, and expressive iteration, I now 
if I have this and iteration on turn three, and I already have my land drop, I no longer am like feeling forced into trying to get the most value out of my iteration. I can find time to squeeze in that two mana later because now I'm able to leave up mana. Uh, because yeah, of this card. Like yeah, that. exactly. Which I kind of like. Yeah, I, I agree with what y'all said. And I, I don't have very much to add here. I, I think that uh, it has its places in decks. And like y'all said, in spots where maybe it's going to be harder to weave in a lots of different spells in a turn, you know? Uh, I think this card is probably much more likely to see play there than Expressive, despite Expressive being a stronger card on base rate. Spencer, what's your first uh, sleeper? Yeah, so my first sleeper is Sunset Revelry. It is one and a white for a sorcery. If an opponent has more life than you, gain four life. If an opponent controls more creatures than you, create two one one human tokens. And if an opponent has more cards in hand than you, draw a card. When this card was uh, was previewed, I felt really weird that nobody like saw this and was like, "Well, this is just like." better timely <laughs> like what is what is happening um I, I think this card's like uh we it was funny because back in the day on the show we used to have the this this joke that we that we would do this episode called the theory of words and it was like all, one of our magic theories that like if a card just had enough words on it it would see play in magic that's a sure, lot less funny. funny yeah that's a lot yeah yeah quite like you know, Deathrite Shaman is an example of, like, the theory of words. Where, so that's just, just... I don't know what this card says. I'm not going to take the time to read it, but I'm sure that it's going to see play. Uh, th this card has a lot of words on it. Um, and, like, when are the times where this card's bad? When you're really far ahead? Like, what? <laughs> I, I don't know. This this card, to me... Um, I don't know. It just, like, screams... I, I already have Timely in a bunch of my historic decks that I think this card fits way better into. Interesting. Yeah, I, I think that this card definitely has a, a real shot of seeing play in standard, you know, especially as like a sideboard option for aggressive decks. I'm curious to see how that does play out with Timely, because I mean, being a mana less is the world sometimes, especially in those aggressive decks. So, yeah, I think this card has a, you know, a real shot of being a player in standard. I'm curious now to see how things will bear out in the historic format. Like, I, I think that like Modern, for example, is one where like, uh, I've played a lot of blue-white control in Modern. I've played uh, uh, a lot of, like, Jeskai decks in, in Modern also. And, you know, like, I've played main deck Timely Reinforcements in some Modern formats. I, I would much rather play this card main deck than Timely Reinforcements 10 out of 10. So Interesting. I don't know, what yeah, about you? Think... What are your... Oh, go ahead. I was just sad to think about that more. I don't know. My first cut is there. Hey, what do you think? I think, uh... I don't know, like... Timely Reinforcements was a card that, like, kind of out of necessity in all other formats has been played in the main deck. I think this kind of feels like a Timely Reinforcements that's redesigned for, like, a best-of-one era. The fact that it can, like, cycle some amount of the time when uh, your opponent has more cards in hand than you is, like, really strong. Um, but I think because of the fact that, like, it's a card you kind of want to milk, like, how often are you really behind on like life creatures and cards together so you have to kind of figure out like when it is the right. best time you need to cast it like do you need more cards than you need life or than creatures like how long can you afford to hold this because of the tension of like well if they ever empty their hand more than me now i don't get a card um it's kind of really interesting but the fact that it also cycles at parity because of the fact that you both have right. like you both have seven cards and you play it it still draws a card like I don't know. I, I think it's really difficult to know how well it applies to, like, an eternal format because there's just so many variables. But I do think this card uh, has has a big chance. Like, I, I was really close to putting it on my list too. I, I think it's like incredibly strong to say the floor on the card is like cycle, and some amount of times it's raise the alarm, draw a card, gain for life, draw a card. Yeah, I I think that the 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 thing to think about because when you when you think about moments where you're going to get all three modes, it actually means you're really far behind. Right, like when when you're gonna get all three modes, you very much need all three modes. So it, it is kind of like you the balancing act that you mentioned. I think is important. Where you like, when are you bringing this card in, and what is it for? Because while I made the comment about playing timely in the main deck, sometimes I think that that has to be very format specific. And I think that this card is very much like, you know, 
uh, trying to man i just realized that i don't have to worry about Embercleave with these tokens that's so powerful um <laughs> This, like, this card, by the way, is really good against one drop with haste when you're on the play. Yeah, it's like they like, go draw land haste, and you go land gain two, yeah, make two two yeah, yeah, draw card. Yeah, yeah, like, oh man! Yeah, like one one's Monastery with haste has never felt so bad. Anyway, I like got distracted by the fact that these tokens don't have to worry about Emmercleave. I, I, yeah, I think this card's just like it's funny. I, I mentioned this during one of Abe's cards, but. It feels like people just don't appreciate role players enough. Because, like, this card is probably going to be one of my favorites. What's your next card? Yeah, I was pulling it up really quick just to make sure that... It, I was pretty sure it was Unnatural Moonrise. Um, mm -hmm. And this is one... By the way, um, I was st I was texting a uh, former co-host of the show, uh, Michael Hinderocker, like... I don't. It was it last week that I was t asking him about. Uh, you were you're in that thread, Mason, where I was asking him about um, brave brave the elements, and he yes, and he called it a lord, and I had never thought of brave the uh, brave the elements as a lord before, and then literally the day after I text him, this card was previewed, <laughs> and I was like, oh. I see, like, this... So, so for what it's worth, Unnatural Moonrise is a red and a green. For a sorcery, uh, it becomes night. Until end of turn, uh, creatures you control get plus one, plus zero, and gain trample. Whenever this creature deals combat player damage to a player, draw a card. And then it also has flashback for two, a green and a red. Um, So when he called Brave, like... I'd never thought of, like, a sorcery as a lord, right? Like, I always thought of them as, you know, two and three mana dudes that, you know, pump my other dudes. I'd never thought of the fact that, like, there's there you can have a, a one-turn instant or sorcery lord. And, listen, uh, they clearly want us to look carefully at werewolves. Uh, like... Uh, the, uh, I don't know what nickname this podcast will be using for the uh, Night Bolt, but or whatever. I don't know. You know, we'll have to take a vote Nightning on that. Bolt. Night Nightning Bolt. I don't. <laughs> Nightning Bolt. Nightning Bolt. But like this card is so good. The the fact that they changed the mechanics for werewolves, right? Where like you have like it's either night or day, and then you can just make it night. All your creatures get bigger. And, like, if I hit you, I'm drawing... Like, that's that's a lot of... This is the theory of words, man. Like, there are so many words on this card. Um. So, yeah. And then the fact that it has flashback is kind of unreal to me. Like, I, I, I don't know that this card needed flashback, but the fact that it has it is sweet. Sure. You, you gonna make a night again? Like, come on. Yeah, I think it's worth mentioning, too, because we haven't talked about it on the show yet, but Day-Night is the new werewolf mechanic. So if you played an original Innistrad or Shadows of Innistrad, you know that the double face cards there, if you didn't cast spells, would flip on their back, and if you cast two, they go to their front. So now that's called Day and Night. Uh, old cards aren't changing, but going forward, it seems to be that with the way werewolves and stuff like that are going to work. And what's important to note, the big, big difference is that if it's nighttime, cards enter your hand on their backside. They're in or as the night half. So making it night's actually incredibly relevant because sometimes the you know the werewolves we're going to be looking at need a little bit of help or need, are expected you know for it to maybe require a bit of setup and this card already does that for you while it's still getting to develop to your board you know you don't have to take that time off to make it nighttime so I, I think that you know being a night enabler is I think something that's pretty relevant yeah that that's kind of what I thought about too when I thought about it being like a lord right like this this turns it into night it turns your humans into flipped werewolves. Um, whether they're in your hand or on the battlefield, which is pretty cool. Yeah, I think also the incentives around being nighttime are like huge, right? Like like Mason was saying, all of your daybound, nightbound, two sided cards coming in on the night side is significantly more powerful, and it puts the ball in your opponent's court to like, all right, cast two spells, or else this is going to keep happening to you, right? Like I I'm gonna it's going to stay nighttime and I'm going to cast on a nighttime thing and it's going to keep like, you know, I'm going to keep the, the pressure on. And so, uh, and the ability to do that in a longer game too, with the flashback, despite the fact maybe you're like kind of running out of steam or you like 
need to be casting things all the time. Are you running out of steam? Uh, you just you drew, circumvent. You just drew a bunch of cards. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, right. So, so you're gonna be able to keep a knight for sure. But like, <laughs> it's hard to get from day to night without taking a turn off or having like some amount of instance. This naturally doing that for you makes it a lot better in a constructed setting where you kind of want to be spending all your mana every turn. Which it is, also yeah. helps fix the problem that it creates, right? Like it. By giving you those cards, it's going to, like, disincentivize you from making your werewolves into humans. But it's like, don't worry, the flashback will fix that. You're good. Cast yeah. your spells, please. Yeah, that's a good point. Which is nice. Um, I think that's going to do it for our sleepers. Let's move on to our favorites. So these are cards that are just kind of favorites of ours. They might be particularly strong. For me, I think these cards are going to be pretty big players. Um, but this one's sort of, you know, play it by ear on how we think about that. My first favorite is Renin7. And she is a 5-mana Legendary Planeswalker with 5 loyalty, and she has 4 abilities. Her first one is plus 1, reveal the top 4 cards of your library, put all land cards revealed that way into your hand, and the rest into your graveyard. 0, put any number of land cards from your hand onto the battlefield tapped. Hello, Amulet. Uh, and then minus 3, create a green tree folk creature token with reach. And this creature's power and toughness are equal to the number of lands you control. And then minus 8, return all permanent cards from your hand, I'm sorry, from your graveyard to your hand, then you get an emblem with you have no maximum hand size. So, I think Renin 7 is one of the better walkers we've had in a while, and I think she's going to do a whole lot to enable graveyard strategies, make these bigger green mid-range decks able to work, and she kind of wins you the game, too, with her token. And I think a Seekus Chariot is another card that plays a really big role with this token, where you're kind of creating an army once you get the first one down. And I, I think Renin 7, while it doesn't have a way to, like, remove a creature hard off the board, you know, like if it was some, like, minus three deal damage equal number of lands controlled to a creature, that might be better in some instances. But I think Ren just provides you with a whole lot of resources that you get to play with. And then from there, it's kind of pretty trivial to win the game and it allows you to double spell more. And I think, you know, a good Ren and Seven deck probably has a fair amount of flashback spells that you can take advantage of the plus. And, you know, the extra man to do that thanks to the finding of lands. Even if you just keep ticking up and you don't zero to put in, you know, a bunch of lands, if you're just making your land drops every turn, you're going to really take over the game by consistently casting spells. So I, I think Ren 7 is one of the better cards in the set, and uh, I, I think it's going to be a huge player. I don't know how you feel about that, Abe. Uh, I I fully agree with you. I think Renin 7 is a uh, planeswalker I really like because I think that it is really powerful, but only in, like, one way. It's not like a... A lot of times we get used to Planeswalkers, they're like, oh, you get a little bit of card advantage, you can maybe answer a thing, you tick it up enough times, you win the game. This isn't really that. It's kind of a more dynamic feel where, like, are you playing this to mulch a bunch to get a bunch of lands in your hand, and then, like, you know, flashback spells or graveyard synergies, or do you just want to pay five mana for, like, a pretty good rate creature of, like, a 5-5 five, five for five with reach, and uh, and then, like, you also have this planeswalker that's going to do all these other things. This token's going to grow. You can maybe make another one. Like, um, it's like very much a threat of a planeswalker and less of like a planeswalker of a planeswalker, if that makes sense. And, and I think it's a really good one at that too. I think the fact that it's a more honed blade in that direction means that it is much better at that job. For sure. Spencer, what do you think? Uh, my initial reaction to this card was just it reminded me of the green, the really the terrible goggles deck that Quentin made me play at a state championship after Brad Nelson top aided a tournament with it. Um, it was like this mill ramp land deck, um, uh, that played pyromancers. Got or I don't remember the Chandra's goggles. I don't yeah, remember. It was the pyromancers goggles deck. Yeah. I uh, played the worst version of that at my first PT. When yeah. You played the red green version. Yeah. It was like one of the worst decks I've ever played. And, uh, this card reminded me of it, so like I had a pretty negative reaction to seeing this card, just remembering that experience. But I do think that like what Abe said is is true. I think that just having these different styles of planeswalkers that enable different strategies rather than just mid range and control uh, is pretty sweet. It's actually one of the reasons that I like three mana Chandra so much. The the one that makes elementals is because I think that it you know is it's so for aggressive decks. Um, so yeah, I, I I like the card. I I hope that it doesn't become. I hope that it doesn't get broken. Like cards like this, these these engine cards that mulch, mulch is a powerful card. Like I know that people probably don't want to hear that, but I actually do think mulch is a really powerful card. And so having mulch on a stick does kind of scare me. Fair. Well, 
my other card is Towaller's Huntmaster. So it's four green green for a human werewolf 6-6. Six, six. When this creature enters the battlefield, it creates two green wolf creature tokens, and it's day bound. And then the nine half, Tovalar's pack leader is a werewolf 7-7. Seven, seven. And then when this enters the battlefield or attacks, you create two 2-2 two, two green wolf creature tokens. Then it has two green green. Another target wolf or werewolf you control fights creature target creature you don't control. Um, and then night bound, of course. Uh, this card is basically the green grave titan in a lot of ways. Uh, if you can get the back half of it, you know, uh, it will be attacking. And when it's played, you're going to make these werewolves. And even if you don't get the attack trigger, you're stuck in daytime for a little while while you have the hunt thing. It's still a six mana 10, 10 across two bodies. And I think this sort of card um, is a fine one or two of top end for kind of aggressively slanted green mid range decks. They haven't really got to exist. You know, we talked before at the beginning of the podcast with all these cards being kept down. This is a card I can't really expect to play if it's going to get Brazen Bar or Love Struck Beast is clogging up the ground, that sort of thing. I just can't be having those sort of trades happen. But I think as a one or a two of this reminds me a lot of like a Broodmate Dragon type card, and I hear about those in the past. So I don't know how you feel about this one, Spencer, but it's a card I'm pretty excited for. It uh, is actually on my list. It is uh, one of my hopefuls. Um... You know, I, I remember the first, like, one of the first decks that I was I was trying to make work was this um, this Rampaging Bailoth Grave Titan uh, ramp deck. Like, it was this, like, it was, uh, it might have even played, like, Chase the Mind Sculptor too. It was, like, you know, uh, this three-color controlling ramp deck. And the, the type of ramp decks that I like to play are control decks. Like... They, I, I, as much as I love the combo versions, like the my favorites are like Wolf Run Ramp, um, Scape Shift. Like they may have a combo finish, but like in essence, what I'm trying to do is control the board, gain an mana advantage, and then win with the big thing. Um, and you know the way that control decks do that typically is they do they spend removal to gain mana advantage with having cheaper removal. They you know have a big finisher whether that's a planeswalker or a large creature, um, and and so on and so forth. And you know th- this card is pretty perfect for the type of finishers that I like to play in my ramp decks, um, while also being like it, it's funny you mentioned Broodmate Dragon. Um, Broodmate Dragon was the six mana finisher of Jund until Grave Titan was printed, and then it became one Grave Titan and one Inferno Titan. Like, <laughs> so that's funny. It's it's uh yeah I, I I just this this card harkens back to some of my you know favorite Magic memories you know Broodmate Dragon Grave Titan um it it actually reminds me so much of a Titan that it's kind of weird like. It's like Werewolf Titan. It's like, right when I saw this card, it was just so weird. Um, this is on my hopeful because this is uh, this is a card I plan to build around. Like, I, 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 I will do my darndest to make sure that there is a deck playing this card. So. That's fair. Abe, do you have any thoughts on this card, or do you just want to hop It's like an apology place? for, for Primeval Titan, you know? <laughs> well, like, nobody like, needs hey, to apologize for Primeval Titan. Let's... Hey, we're sorry. <laughs> Primal Titan, a little too good. A little too good. Here we gave you Grave Titan 2. It's got a second side. It counts. It's really the Bane of Field of the Dead. They're, they felt bad. Like, your, your <laughs> yeah. Primal Titans aren't also Grave Titans now. And so, here you go. Now you can Summoner's Pack for this one if you really need a Grave Titan. I know it's exciting for all you Amulet players out there. Of course. Um, yeah. one, one, of the, one of the interesting things to think about with this card is it's, it's activated ability on the backside you know, depending on what, like, what other green creatures or that you, like, other green wolf werewolf type cards you can play, obviously you can fight with it as the 7-7, seven, seven, but it is, it is entirely... You cannot. Oh, it's another one then. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah, but you could, like, fight with, like, your Arlen or whatever. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. it could be interesting to see if, like, there's, uh, I don't know. Like maybe 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 werewolves that you want to die would be like an interesting thing. I don't know. It, there there's certainly potential with that ability. Um, you know we we've seen that effect that that activated ability to be good on other cards, but obviously this one, like you said, uh, can't. Speaking of uh, like boomer Jun cards, it's like a master of the wild hunt meets a grave type. You know? 
Oh, man. Master of the Wild Hunt. That's a good cube card for what it's worth. I'm sure, actually, Mason has probably played that. You don't know what that is? Oh, man. First pick first pick that in your next cube draft. That card's really powerful. Island draft's little white decks. What if I told you Hill Giant was a Planeswalker? That's all you need to know. <laughs> That's terrible. <laughs> hey! <laughs> what is your first favorite from this set? Uh, my first favorite is um, Siphon Insight is a blue-black instant for a blue and a black. Uh, you look at the top two cards of target opponent's library, exile one of them face down, and put the other on the bottom of that library. And you may look at and play the exiled card for as long as it remains exiled, and you may spend mana as though it were mana of any color to cast that spell, and it has flashback for one, a blue and a black. So this is kind of like... Uh, I remember seeing someone joke on Twitter that it was like, drink twice. It's Siphon Insight, but it's like, think twice. Uh... You know, your old two mana like draw a card with you know one blue black get another card to pull ahead like the first one's just a cantrip the second one is actual advantage and i really just like that kind of card i've like i love think twice and this is just like more of a like hearthstoney play with your opponent's cards kind of uh kind of effect that i think is really cool the fact you can take lands from it still is really awesome the fact that it lets you like kind of play with like more than eight cards in hand at some points like you get that like gaunty experience from if you play, like arena cubes or whatever where you get to take their thing and then you get to like play with their best card um i just think it's like a, a really neat neat game piece that has like good uh good applications possibly constructed if there's like you know reason to play it in a blue black control deck if their cards aren't that like bad uh and and does the thing i don't know how you guys feel about drink twice? Uh, I think that everybody should have to take a shot every time somebody says drink twice. Um, but I, I, I actually had not heard of this card before you just read it, so I'm kind of processing it in my head still. Oh, I thought this was the better think twice you were talking about earlier. Were you talking about the clue one then? Uh, no, the, we were talking about Thaben, Thraben Inspe Inspector. Oh, Thraben uh, that, Inspector, that's right. And I was talking yeah, about yeah. the sorcery that makes a crab and a clue. Oh, that crab yeah, has yeah. no power. Yeah, obviously. Yeah. Who needs power? It's supposed to the block. The is Ancestral Recall. Um, anyways, yeah, this card is really interesting to me. Uh, from like a power level standpoint, I'm a little hesitant on it. But it is definitely, like, think twice letting you find the card you, you put in your deck to enable your strategy. It's really strong. This card's really fun and cool because, you know, you get to figure out how to use your opponent's cards most optimally, which is a really skill-testing and interesting way to do things. Um, and makes me wonder, like, is this my win condition in a blue-black deck? Can I just can I only play four of these and be like, yeah, I'll find something from them and I'll answer everything else? Wasn't there like I, don't, a, I don't know. Wasn't there, like, a blue-red factor fiction that did this? Uh, Steam Auger, and I... No, there, there's one where, like, you split cards off your library. There's, there's no, not a... It's, no, there was Blue a... Red doesn't steal from people's libraries, I don't think. I feel like there was another card... The Exile... Say... Go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say that I think that, like, the, uh... The upside on being able to, like, look at two cards being mitigated... Like, it gives you a little taste of the Thief of Sanity experience... Without, like, uh, you know, the full-blown misery of the Thief of Sanity experience. Wait, misery, and man. Thief of Sanity is just a good time. <laughs> Mason's going to pull one up. He's got one next to him. He's just like... I do, I do have some near me. <laughs> I think there's one in that box over there. You know, I, I, think that, I think that this card probably has... There's There are formats where this card is probably really good. Like, really good. Where, like... You need, like, you, like, kind of what Mason just said, where you want a control deck, but you don't have room for win conditions. But the format is such that, like, I don't know, it makes me want, like, Elixir of like Elix Yeah, it's like Elixir over <laughs> Metality, good stuff. Okay, anyway. Uh, my, other, uh, my other card is Moonvale Regent, which is a three and a red, four, four flying dragon. Uh, with the text, whenever you cast a spell, you may discard your hand. If you do, draw a card for each of that spell's colors. When Moonvale Regent dies, it deals X damage to any target where X the number of colors among permanents you control. Now, this card seems really bad when you read it at first, I think, because you're like, I gotta discard my whole hand. 
but you know this is kind of like experimental frenzy on a four four flyer in some applications uh if you're playing with enough multicolored things like you know you can just kind of tormenting voice on top of casting your uh your other spell and like dig for more action i think it's got like it, as a four four for four it's pretty easy to cast it's like not it's not like an embarrassing card to put in your deck and and play and uh you know, it's just a card that like I think is really cool. I, I think it like there's way there's gotta be ways to make it work. And uh, you know, casting like three color spells and drawing through like discarding a card to draw three cards is huge. Uh but I don't know what you guys think about it. Well it is well, on I... my it is on my list uh for favorites also. This is a card that we actually share on this part of the list. Um it, you know, I, I think uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the dragon that I used to give so much crap on this podcast to. It was like a four mana four four flyer whenever it was targeted. Underbreak region. Yeah, that is like the worst card that anyone has ever been excited about. That just people just tried to force, like force into that decks. Was really good. Yeah. Anyway, uh, <laughs> like, uh, no, it wasn't the this card like. I think the your experimental frenzy point is kind of apt when you think about like like people were willing to just play a four four that like had ward deal three uh and and like the upside on this card is so much higher than that the upside on this card is this this like the upside the potential upside is like this could get banned like I think that's how good this card could be. Do I think that it's that good? No. I think that it, like, is probably kind of mopey and, and medium. But I really like cards that are like that, where, y you know, the, the potential is there. Um, one of the... One of the... Oh, my God, I just realized something. What? This card and Omnath were supposed to be legal together. <laughs> <laughs> That's gas. I, I do think that, like... You know, it, it, you know this this idea of discarding your hand is can can potentially be scary. But the thing is, is that in a lot of cases, you know, if if this is part of my top end, and I'm just like, you know, I I could just go off, and I'd like to see a world in which this can happen. But also, now that I'm thinking about it, I'm really glad this isn't with Omnath. <laughs> so yeah, I was like, discard your hand, I, draw four. Draw I made your the Omnath. Yeah, yeah. Table passage, make a bunch of mana, do it again. Like uh, Mason, I made your eyebrows go to your ears when I said that like the potential upside of this is like ban ban worthy. Um, <laughs> what do you what do you think of this card? I would not. I think this is a card that has to probably be killed on sight. Uh, you know, like if this card sticks around, it probably draws two cards a turn. You know, probably like spell spell land happens a lot. Um, because because this card does discard your hand, like you need things that are going to like move through more cards to keep the chain going, or have really big benefits. We have cards like Foretell that you know are in your hand but aren't really and will help enable this. You know, like this card works really well with those when you hit the land patches. Um, that all being said, I think if the card's strong or whatever, and you have to kill it on sight, and I think that it probably. While being a four mana four four, which is just a good rate, and you'll jam it sometimes on four. I bet you play this card on turn like five or six a lot after you've deployed a lot of spells, and you kind of play it, and you like you know shock something or curiosity along those sort of lines, and find something else to do. Uh, I have a really long history of saying a card won't get banned or isn't a problem, <laughs> and then it getting banned. So I'm here to ruin Brian Gottlieb's life by saying I don't think this card will get banned, just like anything Once Upon a Time where Oko would. Uh, so <laughs> I'm here to help y'all by saying I, that. I, I don't actually think that it's that good. Like, I, I think sure. that it, the the format will check out that way. One of the cards that I thought of when I saw this card, though, um, do you guys remember, it's like a role player that I actually played against, I think, in Historic yesterday. Uh, it's like red and a one... For you, like, you gain two life, and then you, like, discard a card to draw, or discard two cards to draw three or oh, whatever. Oh, the red, white, cathartic. Reason. Yeah, that card oh, seems yeah. really good with this card. Yeah, that, that, card's, that card's a good combo. Yeah. I get you a lot of cards. Yeah, you need, uh, you need I don't know if it actually works that way. Because I think that, like, that one says on resolution you, like, discard the cards, and this one right. says you cast. 
Right. So you, can you cast it, discard your hand, draw two cards, and have to discard those two cards immediately to draw three. Oh, is that how oh. it would work? Yeah, it's not yeah. an additional cost. Uh, yeah, that one isn't like uh, cathartic. You're, you're... That's fair. Okay. That's too bad. No. I was thinking, though, this is like, you know, it's a 4-4 flying Song of Creation, basically. It's yeah. like worse than Song of Creation because you're getting a 4-4 for it. But, you know, it's you a really cool it. card. I like it a lot. <laughs> yeah, I, I think this card sees a lot of play. Um, so, I guess m I only have one favorite. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, so my next one is Bloodline, or my only one that we haven't talked about is Bloodline Culling. This card is one, a black, and a black for an instant. Choose one. Target creature gets minus five, minus five until end of turn. Or uh, creature tokens get minus two, minus two until end of turn. Listen, I like the fun police. I hate tokens decks. Uh, I think that they're some of the least fun decks in Magic. And I like this card existing. I'm glad I'm glad this card exists. This card's dope. It's a, it's, a good, it's a good spell. Yeah, I, I just think that this is like... This is a sweet card that you get to play like one of in your main deck, maybe maybe even more. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a murder with upside in a lot of cases, and in the cases where it's not, I actually find that to be interesting magic. Like if six sixes are relevant, and suddenly you can't play this card anymore, it also means token decks are better. So like suddenly the card gets better. Like the whole thing just is sweet to me. I, I just think this, this card, card is sweet. This card is comically bad against coma. Coma is a 6-6 and makes 3-3 tokens. <laughs> As you were talking about a 6-6, I was like, there aren't any good 6-6s six besides Tovlar, and it kills the wolves. And then I was like, oh uh, yeah, this Coma. <laughs> coma be, coma be Serpentine. That's should, uh, should we move on to Hopefuls? Man, you guys are like stealing all my cards, though. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I didn't realize how many of your cards got stolen until now. I posted mine first, just to be clear to <laughs> listeners. I posted mine before these two. Yeah, but here's the thing. I won't let your free your your choices affect me. Not like Abe the free thinker. You let other people <laughs> melt his views. I won't let I won't let it stop me. So why don't you uh, anyways, why don't you talk about my uh, my first hit and your first hopeful? <laughs> Bloodthirsty adversary. Well, this is a great juxtaposition of the card. Uh, Bloodthirsty adversary is one a red vampire two two with haste. Spencer, by the way, before I continue. That's a great base right now. You don't have to read this card. You're welcome. Uh, when, when, the, enters the battle, when this creature enters the battlefield, you may pay two in a red any number of times. When you pay that cost one or more times, you put that many plus one plus one counters on Bloodthirsty Adversary. Then exile up to that many target instant sorcery cards from your graveyard with mana value three or less and, cop, excuse me, and copy them. You may cast any number of the copies without paying their mana cost. So this is a, you know, I see this as the new Robber of the Rich. So when Robber of the Rich was first previewed two years ago, there was a lot of like, oh, this is fine, whatever. It's weird it has reach. You know, like how often are we really going to cast the spells? And it turns out, not that often, but when we did cast the spells with Robber of the Rich, it was very impactful. And this card strikes me as a very similar version to that, where how often am I going to kick this thing? I don't know. Maybe like once every four or five games or whatever and probably like fires back a you know a lightning slash a little lightning bolt action for me and i'd be really happy about that and it coming in with just the extra counters i think is great and it's just a way to use my mana you know and it's a way to just to continue to play the game with my red decks even when i've drawn a lot of lands and so i think it's great in aggressive decks for that reason i think it's great for aggressively saying the mid-range decks as well because now we can you know curve out when the hands we need to and it can be like a bad rakshasha death dealer and then in the late game it can be a goblin dark dweller um and so i really like this card and for what it's worth i really like that it's an etb and not a win cast on the kick so you know for other formats that let you do things like aether vial so you know get around the cost there but spencer what do you think about this card before we talk about it, since it is one of your hits do you believe it's going to be one of the best cards in the set yeah so i think the number one reason that I decided to move this card into hit, because it actually was going to be on my helpful list, is actually Luris. Um, the fact that you can play this card with Luris is actually a pretty huge deal, in my opinion. Yeah, uh, Luris isn't in standard. Okay. <laughs> the, are, we, are we a standard only podcast? No, no, I was, we were talking about, I was talking about standard. I just wanted to make sure. That okay. I, 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 I wasn't trying to get you. I just to be clear. Luris is a card. It's a, it's a magic card. So, I like, would say it's podcast. the best magic card up until a nerf. Who's yeah. Uh, I think that the fact that, like, you know, you're going to play this card with Luris is huge for, like, 
all kinds of decks like whether it's historic i think even in modern like that actually could become relevant like i know lurus jund lurus jund is what uh, Pi- sure Pi- is lurus jund is in pioneer too isn't it like like i uh, black red lurus is yeah really, sure really cool. uh black red black i think that is actually a big deal um uh, in standard i'm actually thinking about playing this card with delver of secrets you know this getting back explosive iteration this getting like being that kind of the top end that you get in your delver of secrets deck to use a lot of your mana while still getting to kind of skimp on lands because you're playing so many draw effects and 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 filler, I I, I actually think that like this card, it fills a lot of roles across a lot of different decks in a lot of different formats. I, I don't I'm not sure that I like the comparison very much to Snapcaster Mage. I actually like what Mason said quite a bit on Robber of the Rich, um, which by the way, uh, if you are uh, paying attention to something that was earlier on the show, which is that red decks don't steal cards from your opponents and then let you use any oh, color. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but no, I, I, I think this card is like a slam dunk. I, I think it is actually one of the best cards on the set, and I, I actually would not be surprised for it to see play outside of standard. Yeah, yeah I, mean, I, sorry. I think the card's great. Like it's, it's the kind of card that is like almost perfect for like your aggressively slanted mid-range decks or like your mid your aggressive decks that have to transition to mid-range decks in like post cyborg games or in like you know other creature matchups like a red deck that needs to have more access to its lightning strikes or whatever uh like without getting too taxed the kind of like you know acceptable like two two for two with haste that is also like a goblin dark dwellers down the line with also also with haste with haste and like uh, it's really good it's funny i'm like imagining all these scenarios like i as somebody that plays a lot of like blue white control like man just like not being able to tap out because like if they just top deck this you're in so much trouble like yeah if they just draw it (laughs) but also there's so much like about it too because if let's say you are the red player right and you top deck this and you have another spell you're thinking of playing that turn you have like a faceless haven lying around you're not committed against the counter spell because it's not an actual kicker. You have to resolve the spell before you pay. So like you cast this card for two, they, you know, either say like, okay, I'm countering it or they don't. And then you get to choose, you know, I'm kicking it once. If you have a bunch of mana, maybe twice would probably be insane. Like the fact that it scales up is awesome. Um, but yeah, like you can just be like, okay, that's the way I'm spending my turn on turn seven is now I'm going to flash back these two shocks or whatever and attack you for four. And, like, that's the problem you have to deal with. And if they have the answer for it, because that would be too much, you still get to attack with your other creature lands, like your Janet of the Bungbeard yeah. or whatever. It's also, it's also so. just another one where, like, you know, spell lands benefit, like, are, it's another one of those spell lands benefit cards, right? Where, like, you know, these, you get to play quote-unquote less lands, but you, I mean, the whole thing, like, oh my gosh, magic is so sweet. Anyway, Mason, you were going to say something. I was just going to say that it works so well with, you know, like... We look at the specifically standard and maybe some like an aggressive red black deck, right? Like Abe's Hunger for More, they talked about. That card costs the same as the kicker to flash back. So it's like, all right, now I, you know, I got to like kick this card for free, right? And that sort of thing. And this allows your deck to really play really well together. And I think that sort of stuff, when your cards get to be cohesive while broadly powerful and just reward you for playing magic, you know, like I, I don't want cards that make me jump through a lot of hoops unless the hoops are going to make me win the game. When I'm looking for competitive cards. And so this sort of card says, hey, play magic, cast spells, and have lands. And those hoops are ones I'm just going to jump through naturally, so I'm okay with having this on my deck. I liked it when you were going to hump through them, too, for what it's worth. We can we can uh-huh. also... <laughs> I like those. That's the patrons only. <laughs> um, anyways, I'm going to talk about my next <laughs> hopeful card again. That's Augur of Autumn. It's one green green for a human druid 2-3 that says you may look at the top card of your library at any time. You may play lands from the top of your library, and it has Coven. So Coven is as long as you control three or more creatures with different power, you may cast creature spells from the top of your library. So I want to focus on not the Coven part, and then I'll, I'll work my way back to Coven. So just as a base rate, it is a course of crew fix with one less toughness, and you don't gain the life from the lands ETV. So it is a Worse Courser if you'd never reached the Coven part of the game. While one of the benefits of Courser really was that it was so hard to interact and kill, that was like a, a big thing and it stabilized the board. I think there's a lot to be said about a slightly worse Courser of Crufix that will just make sure we're hitting our land drops and doing these sort of things and just continue to scale out and play the game. One of the things that we talk about with a lot of these cards is that 
they benefit you as the game goes on. They have ways to use your mana like the adversaries. There's a whole cycle of things like Bloodthirsty we just talked about. If you haven't looked at this set too closely, I think this card works really well with all of those. And we look at things like Ren and Six, where we just want to consistently be making our land drops. And anytime you play the land off of your top of your deck, it's almost like you drew a card. Very rarely do you actually want to draw the land compared to, you know, playing the land that's on top of your deck. So with those things in mind, I think this card has a real shot of seeing play just for those reasons. Now you get the added upside of that if you somehow have reached Coven, which is three different powers, uh, powered numbers on the battlefield. So zero, one, two, for example, would work. Then you get to play creatures on top of your deck. I think that ability is either win more or win the game, which is a kind of a weird place to be. Because I think in some matchups, it's kind of like, oh, I'm already so far ahead on the board. Yeah, I'm just going to play all these spells. You can never win, idiot. Nice game, nice deck. You know, I'm playing lands and creatures off the top. But in board stall matchups with other creature decks, which happened a fair bit with creature decks in standard, you know, they'll play five or six removal spells. In the past, we had Embercleave to break it. Now we don't have something quite like that. Having this card actually makes sure that, hey, now I get to start casting these creatures, and now I actually, this is my new Embercleave type card. This is the thing that pushes through. And I think this Augur of Autumn has a real shot of just being a really solid card in standard. Uh, it might end up not being there just because of the three toughness, and I think Moon Rage Slash, or Lightning Bolt, as we've been calling it, uh, is one of the best cards in the set. It's going to be format-defining. But I think this card is a real, real shot, and I really hope it gets there. How do you feel yeah. about this card, Abe? Um, whenever I think of Corsair Crew Fix, I actually I think back to my very first GP cache in which I took two losses on day one in Sealed, in, like, Theros block uh, Sealed, one of which to uh, to Shahar Shenhar, in a game where, like, on turn five or something, I, like, offered a trade of my Corsair Crucifix for, like, his Death Touch creature, where I felt like I needed to be aggressive. And I was, you know, I was probably losing this game anyway, for a million reasons, I don't need to tell the story. But he, like, looked at me funny, and then just took the trade and played on, and my friend Danny, who is, like, one of my biggest magic mentors, talked to me after the match was like why did you make that attack like why do you think he looked you funny and i was like i don't know i just felt like i had to beat down so i got in there it's like quarter crew fix is a sphinx's revelation that resolves for the entire game while it's in play and it changed my entire perspective on the card and i think that being able to play lands off the top of your library is so understated because the value of a land is so understated and misunderstood in magic that like whenever you get to make land drops from somewhere that isn't your hand you're drawing way more than you think you are. Like, it's it's more than just like, oh, now I'm drawing more spells. It's I'm able to cast more expensive spells that are in my hand without having to spend time drawing it. It's just such a good ability. And the fact that this eventually scales beyond that to have an immediate effect of, oh, I clear the land off, my, off the top and I get to cast this creature. So strong. And sir? I mean, it's a green, it's a green card that draws cards. I don't, I don't know <laughs> what more I would want in a magic card. <laughs> <laughs> very fair well I, I don't have too much to say about this and you know i want to talk about some other cards here so i'm happy to pass the baton on to abe on to my hopefuls yep my first hopeful is geist flame reservoir uh it is two and a red for an artifact that says whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell put a charge counter on geist flame reservoir and it has two activated abilities both are one and a red so one and a red tap remove any number of charge counters from geist flame reservoir it deals that much damage to any target, and one in a red tap, exile the top card of your library, you may play that card this turn. This card just really reminds me of Dynavolt Tower. And I just always thought that Dynavolt Tower was a really cool card, and the fact that this is like definitely worse because it's a lot more mana intensive to use, and it charges up a lot slower. For people who don't know, Dynavolt Tower like gave you some energy when you cast an instant or sorcery, it gave you like two, and you could tap it and pay five energy to deal three damage to any target. So like you cast like three spells, you get to cast a free lightning bolt along the way. Eventually you store up a bunch of energy. You start, you know, like shooting your opponent. This can do the same kind of thing and helping you kind of do less while still impacting the board. If you have this card, um, you know, you like cast a few cheap removal spells and then the next one's free. And also this card draws you some cards on its own with its second ability. I just think it's uh, like a really sweet one that, if that archetype is good, is an archetype I'm really interested in playing. For sure. It, I don't have a lot to say on this card, because I, I this is one of those cards that's really interesting to me, and I want to think about it more. But I'm curious to hear what Spencer has to say on it. I, once again, have not heard of this card until Abe just said the words. Um, 
And yet you turned in your list before us. Curious. Curious. <laughs> uh, I hate Dynavolt Tower, so if uh, so, I, if it is similar in any way, I do not want this card to be good. I think it's a lot weaker than Dynavolt Tower. I think having to pay two every time you want to discharge it is pretty rough. And also, you don't have like all the energy stuff around it where like Dynavolt yeah. Tower comes down and you already have five, right? You have to play right. this, then your spells. Sure. I, I don't know I I I like engine I like engine cards so I, it's hard for me not to like this. Yeah I don't know I, I'm trying to think there's a way I could like you could make this card kind of shrine of burning ragey too you know. Oh man is that an is that an engine card that's not an engine card that's a you're no, dead I card. Know, that's, a, that's, a, <laughs> that's a big. Engine. But you could right like. <laughs> cast into a sorcery and it gets a charge counter on it and then those are immediately converted into damage like what? this being in play is basically it's, a great it's red red one that's uh, two and a red two two, red. two and a red and then activating it is one and a red tap huh and it also draws some cards i think it's could be a finisher for a delver like, deck yeah maybe the fact it also gives you a little bit more uh like you know you get to like six or seven mana and you're suddenly drawing two cards a turn with this yeah. without really thinking about it. Yeah, I, I had it's... not I had not thought about this, but it actually would make a lot of sense in like a Delver of Secrets uh style standard deck. Yeah. I think I you know, I think it'd be cool if this is the kind of thing that, you know, happens again. I think it's like a cool way to make sure that you can have answers to like bigger things or like more mileage out of more like dirtily assemble the right kind of spells decks. So I'm, I'm hoping that it, that it plays out. My second card uh, is Flame Chandler, another red card advantage thing, which is a uh, Flame Chandler is a two one, uh, or sorry, a two two, for one and a red. Uh, it's a human wizard, and it has whenever a spell you control deals damage, transform it, and then on its transformed side, uh, it says whenever a spell you control deals damage, put a flame counter on uh, Embodiment of Flame, which is the name on the other side. Uh, and you can pay one mana and remove a flame counter from Embodiment of Flame to exile the top card of your library, and you may play that card this turn. So this is like, uh, it's kind of like an Abbot of Carol Keepy kind of like card advantage, red, like, you know, you cast your like shock, and then you get to like, your card gets better, and uh, it like draws some cards down the line. But I, I'm like, hoping that's good enough to be able to play like a two mana two two in red without it just getting traded off or like it's too much work to get a uh, to get like start getting cards out of it but it does seem like a card that has a lot of potential to run away and the fact that it's so easy to turn to like transform it and to start getting cards out of it through just dealing a damage like you could play a spike field hazard to your opponent's face like just one damage anywhere and this card's enabled is really appealing and so i don't know if you guys have opinions on this card I actually put this in my mono red deck for my article this week for like the first drop of new standard decks. And uh, the main reason I put it there was less so that like, you know, it's an engine and drawing the extra cards, but more so it's a cheap day night enabler for red decks that uh, does have some extra kick. And, you know, having a two drop that if your opponent fails to play as well, this becomes a three power creature that enables your moon rage slash for a little while, I think is very appealing. I, I think this card just has I, a, a I don't lot think of that's how that card works, Mason. How does I'm thinking of a different card then? I maybe yeah. misheard you. Well, anyways, I I think this card is in my deck. I think it is close to good enough either way. Um, <laughs> I confused it with the other human wizard. Oh so yeah, 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 yeah. The uh, I have to find their name. Um, wait, no, no. It doesn't it doesn't work it, with day it, and night it's though? Not it's, I'm sorry. It's not night, yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Sorry, yeah, yeah. It, it flips on its back, but it's definitely, definitely technically not day night. But it does work with uh, moon moon slash, whatever it's called. Um, does it? Yeah, I, I think this. Well, yeah, like uh, that's a spell that flips this. Like you're like this card wants to play with burn spells, right? Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh okay, sure, sure, just, sure, sure. Just, yeah, yeah. Lava spike them. I understand what yeah, you're yeah. saying. Okay. Yeah, I, I jumbled this all up a little bit. It was just a card that can play well with Moon Rage Slash. Yeah, if you're um, if you're playing with a bunch of damage spells, which you do want to in Mono Red, it's obviously really good. I think this yeah. card is sweet, but I feel like my feelings are hurt that you did Abbot of Carol Keep so dirty comparing the two. Because <laughs> like, I love Abbot of Carol Keep. I Abbot of Carol Keep was the first of many red Karmagoyfs I, I almost fell for in my in my days of trading for all the cards I am. 
Oh man, I uh, was a big proponent of cutting all of your dark confidants for Abbot of Carol keeps, and it definitely uh, worked for my some one of my teammates uh, got got them to a pro tour when they took that advice from me. So, and then it's bared out to be true over time. Uh, I mean, nobody <laughs> plays nobody plays dark confidant anymore, so you know neither of those cards see any play. <laughs> Run in sixth. Darn it. <laughs> Yeah, that's a, that's way better. Uh, I, I do think that the card is like kind of similar though. You know, it's just it's aggressive. It's like the right stats to be attacking. It like gets to be powerful once you start casting spells, and then it also get, generates you some card advantage. It, it's in the wrong order for it to be really good, but sure, sure. I, I'll go on to my uh, my hopeful. I believe we're still on hopeful, right? Yeah, we are. And this is the only one that I got to talk about because, you know, he's stealing my cards. Uh, Dire Strain Rampage is one, a red, and a green for a sorcery. Come on. Come on, people. How long have you listened to this podcast? You didn't think I was going to talk about this card? Come on. Come on. This card is destroyed target artifact, enchantment, or land. If a land was destroyed this way, the controller may search, the controller mason may search their library for up to two basic land cards. Otherwise, it's controller. If a land was destroyed, otherwise it's controller. Mister the library for up to one basic land card. Put it on the battlefield tapped and shuffled their library. It also has flashback for some freaking reason. For three, a red and a green. Listen, Harrow is one after my own heart. We already talked about the green red ramp decks that I enjoy playing. The type of decks I like to play. Uh, unfortunately for this card compared to Hyro, uh, these lands do not <laughs> enter the battlefield untapped. Um, but it, it does have some nice flexibility. I think this is like kind of a fun two of ramp spell that you can play in your ramp decks to answer hard to deal with permanents, um, that, you know, can, can kind of really bridge, bridge the, the, to the really late game when you get, when you're targeting yourself, right? Like, I can kill my opponent's hard to deal with thing and then flash it back getting me two lands to, you know, kind of get to that seven mana. It is it is probably not... It is not going to... I, I do not see a world in which this is a four of in, in a ramp deck. I think that that would be a strange world to live in. Um, but I do think that, like, the utility of this card is pretty strong, uh, and I am hopeful that, you know, just having a ramp spell that is also a utility spell is a good sign for ramp decks. So that's why I'm hoping for this. The so flagstones of Tarkir world is when you have four of this. <laughs> oh. <laughs> a little bam. Explosive edge. I think it's kind of awesome. I think that like the fact you're, you know, fifth three mana ramp spell or whatever, like you're going to play cultivates or whatever and you want to play like one more can also just be your, uh, like your first disenchant. Uh, and also this flashback. So it can, if there's a deck that's very strong, with a lot of artifacts and enchantments, drawing this one copy actually makes a very meaningful difference, as opposed to just being uh, like, "Well, I." Yeah, especially in a ramp deck, the one piece, where like you're gonna you're going to get to flash it back, right? Like that's just gonna yeah. happen in those style of decks. And, and you know, I, the the other reason, Abe, you actually just really hit on another important piece. Like cultivate's not going anywhere, so like I'm not I'm not playing this over cultivate. Like that's not happening. Yeah. So. But you can always play more cultivate. <laughs> Wait, is Cultivate rotating? It cultivates in the, the Strixhaven thingy, but it's not in standard, I think, anymore. What is this, dude? What is that is, is that like? true? Because, yeah, the, the Mystical Archive cards aren't in standard, right? Like, we don't have... This is like how Shock them. isn't legal. What? Yeah, so Cultivate is not in standard anymore. Just, oh, I, I, that... I, just, you, I could see you playing this card... <laughs> As a four of if there are no cultivates. I don't know. It's hard, right? It, wait, is Wolf Willow Haven gone too? Are all of yeah. the ramp spells gone? No, you have the one that makes a fracture token or whatever. It like turns the land into an elemental. There's a learn spell. There's like there's field, field trip. trip. Well, I don't know that field trip learn. is good enough, right? I mean, there's the four. There's the six mana spell that can be four mana that puts two lands in play for you <laughs> and one in your hand and one for them. <laughs> Ah oh, man, I'm gonna have to build a ramp deck to, to try and... draft format and for many chaos. Deck. I did not realize Your Cultivate was so rotating. Good. That hurts my feelings so much, Wizards. Yeah, that that was a core set card from two years ago. And we lost Migration Path, the other best ramp spell ever. Played. Yeah, what is what? Uh, 
All right, my feelings are hurt. I, I, I am hopeful for this card. Like, I think that, like, you know, it, that this this is a good fun of in ramp decks, and I, I hope to see it see play. Uh, should we I, move on to hits? Or do you want to say something, Mason? I was going to say, yeah, I think that's really reasonable. And then I was going to segue to the hits. They didn't mean to be too reckless there. Uh, but I'll start things off with a Reckless Stormseeker. Reckless Stormseeker is two and a red for a human werewolf, two, three. At the beginning of combat on your turn, target creature gets plus one, plus zero, and haste until end of turn and is day bound. And then the back half is Storm Charge Slasher, which is a 3 4. At the beginning of combat, target creature you control gets plus two, plus zero, and gains trample in addition to haste until end of turn. So the, the thing that I think to the thing about with this card is that it's a three mana 3 3 with haste at worst, right? Like it targets itself, you attack for three the turn you play it. We have a lot of, excuse me, hasty red creatures as we talked about. You know, we have the Bloodthirst Adversary from earlier. We have this. And then afterwards, right, every creature we play is going to now get haste as well. And haste is basically just one of the best keywords ever printed. So now suddenly, you know, we play our Seeker's Chariot. We animate it with itself and then we attack in, right? Just huge swing turns. Just incredible. And if your opponent isn't coming to the battlefield... You're actually going to get the additional plus two plus zero on this card and hit them for harder. Uh, and you can always just target yourself or target some, you know, little creature you have laying around, right? You have some little raging goblin from one one, right? Now it's a two one and actually maybe trades with something and makes for bad blocks for your opponent. So I think this card is an easy hit in my opinion. I think it is one of the best red cards uh, in the set when it comes to like an aggressively slanted deck. And it's just going to do a lot of things that are incredibly powerful. But I think this into a Seekus Chariot is just a curve that people are not quite yet ready for. Do you have any thoughts on that, Abe? Go to you first. Uh, I just I just love that every card that costs three mana for you, perfect with the Seekus Chariot. People aren't ready for it. <laughs> <They> <laughs> are. People are not ready for any three drop, a Seekus Chariot. No one's ready. And I think that might actually be really telling about what the format's like, that people just are not ready for a Seekus Chariot. Could yeah, be very let me true. tell you about one of my hopefuls, Gabe, because, you know... Is it a Seekus Chariot? <laughs> no, <different>? it's... <laughs> well, no, it's like a sorcery that deals with a Seekus Chariot and oh, gives yeah, them a land. I made another cat token, I, and now I, I'm a land. <laughs> I just love... Uh, two things. Uh, one, I love... This has to be the most Raging Goblin has ever been mentioned on a Magic podcast <laughs> in history. Uh, and, you know, seven, you know, 12 year old Spencer or whatever, you know, sixth grade Spencer who thought Raging Goblin was the best because, you know, it came down and hit my opponent before they could ever do anything. You know, he'd be so proud of us. <laughs> um, the second thing is I also am just impressed with the number of chariot mentions in this podcast. <laughs> uh, when that card was spoiled, I text uh, Mason, Matt, and Michael, and I was like, I've never wanted a card to see play more in my life. It makes these cute little kitties. And then, like, it takes – it's like the picture is of these cats that is, like, dragging a, like dragging this chair. I just love it. I love the whole thing. This, this card – this card is an interesting hit to me. I agree. I think it reminds me a lot. Knowing Mason now, as long as I haven't done this podcast with him for like a year now, uh, it reminds me of the Arnie pick. And I'm willing to like I, I want to make this joke so bad that this is just Arnie 2.0. That when I'm wrong and Mason's a genius, I'm so ready for this to you know be egg on my face. But I don't know. Like I I do think the the fact that it gives every one of your subsequent creatures haste is really appealing. I'm not sure that like three mana three three haste like like i'm not sure that the floor of it is high enough for me to really consider your constructed card but i do think that like in general giving other creatures haste and this being a haste thing on its own like it giving other things haste is probably better to me than the fact it has haste on its own when it comes down and like when it's done right and it, you can like fit it in the like you know fervor or fires of you off my effect is really strong have you seen the alternate art for this card, though, Abe? No, I always feel bad. <laughs> <laughs> what it reminds? It's like uh, it reminds me of the those two murderous brothers from uh, Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood that are like uh, that. Those two, they're soulbound to the. <laughs> 
Anyway, Mason knows what I'm talking about. You need I should the get some from. Uh... No, 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 no. The the murderer ones, the ones that make that make him question if he's a real boy. Oh, okay. You know, you know what I'm talking about. You know, you know what I'm talking about. I, you a... should, if you don't know what he's talking about, you should go over to Oasis Games and check it out. And then and then go watch Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood and see. I mean, if you haven't watched Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood, you really should, Mason, because it's a great it's show. Good. It's yeah. Very good. Yeah. You can listen yeah. to the Meet to Nerd podcast for our review of it. Anyway, uh, what's your next card? I, I cannot believe. I just hang on. I am just shook <laughs> about the hate that my case enabling three drop. I get it. From y'all. Hold on, just to be clear, because this happened with the freaking. Hogak thing where everybody gave me crap for Mason's hatred of Hogak. I want to be clear. I said this is an interesting hit for me. I did not say this card was bad. I also didn't say the alternative art was bad. I have said nothing <laughs> bad I about this that, card. I stand by that. Okay, I'm just saying <laughs> that I didn't say any of that. So don't come at me that I'm the one that gave Grey Merchant of Asphodel zero on our set review when I did not do that. Anyway, continue, Mason. Abe, <laughs> oh, I'm also, it has it has Arnie Broken Bow vibes. Abe, you're also on like almost at six months on the podcast. Let's let's chill out. It's really <laughs> only been six months. I feel like I've been doing this my whole life, man. Yeah, I know it feels that way when Eldrain's around. Uh, <laughs> anyways, my last hit is probably gonna get poo pooed on as well at this rate. It's Moon Rage Slash or Moon Rager Slash, which is two in a red instant. Uh, this spell costs two less to cast if it's night. And it deals three damage to any target. So this is the lightning bolt we talked about earlier. You get nighttime lightning bolt. Um, I think that you only really need about eight day night cards to consistently cast this card for one mana on turn three or four, which allow you to kind of double spell. And I think between this and frostbite, uh, red has a lot of ways to control the battlefield. I think three toughness is really the breaking point. I mentioned earlier with my card Augur of Autumn how that two three nature might actually keep it from being as impactful as I think it will be. And this card is one of the reasons for that, where I just think that three toughness is now the break point, same for loyalty and that sort of thing. I think red decks are going to be consistently, excuse me, so sorry, consistently answering your three power, your three toughness cards. And so I think this card is a huge hit. And <laughs> I, you know, I joked on Twitter, like this is a reason to be a dedicated day night deck because flipping like, going to nighttime and having this card active is so huge. And I think it's very funny that if your opponent is day night, they can turn this card on for you. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. What do y'all think? Is it slow? Is this what's worse? This or reckless storm? I really want to see this card have an application where I'm playing like zero day night cards. <laughs> and I like the format in such a way that I'm just like playing open fire in the hopes that it's lightning bolt. Like that'd be so clean. Oh man! Sheesh. <laughs> Here, uh, I I think that one of the interesting things to me, uh, I actually posted a meme that I stole from somewhere, of, uh, I don't even know what show it's from because I've actually not watched the show of like the dad and this the this the Superman dad and his kid and like the dad's a bad guy. Invincible. Yeah, I haven't watched it yet. I'm gonna watch it, but I you, you know it's all over TikTok, so I know I know everything that happens already. But you know, it's like look at look at what these people have to do to get a fraction of our power. And you know, listen, listen. I I am of the opinion that Mana Leak, Lightning Bolt, Doom Blade, Cultivate slash Ramper Growth, or whatever. What Mason? I, I, forgot, I forgot. I forgot this. Though. Keep going. It's also for the, the white one. <laughs> oh. He's so mad. <laughs> Does white get a card in the circle? And, and, <laughs> and, and, like, Condemn slash Path to Exile should just be in standard all the time. Like, I I don't know. Like, what? so first of all, uh, it's cool that this card exists. I'm glad that somebody gets to have a lightning bolt because I think that people should just get to have lightning bolts. I, I think that this card is probably ahead. I, I think that... You know, we've already talked about a card that just makes it nighttime. Like, that just it is now nighttime, people. And uh, I'm, I'm glad. And, I, you know, we already have, you know, this green, green, 3-3 three, three wolf that, you know, draws a bunch of cards. And, like, like they they very much would like us to, <laughs> to do this thing. And I'm okay with that. Um, it's funny, though. I do wish that this 
was just uh I don't know. I don't know if I would have preferred it to be like a different style of werewolf enabler where it was like like green and a red for an instant that like dealt damage and did something else. It could like deal damage to the face and then target a wolf or something. I don't know. But like I think about um uh, wizard's lightning, and like the the requirement for that is pretty easy, right? You just have to have a wizard in play. The requirement for this is actually a lot harder than wizard's lightning, right? It's specifically needing to be knight is actually harder than just controlling a wolf or a werewolf. Um, so it's interesting. Yep. Agreed. Well, Abe, what's your first card for your hits? My first hit is Lier, disciple of the Drown, which is a legendary creature for three blue blue uh, it says spells can't be countered and each instant or sorcery card in your graveyard has flashback the flashback cost is equal to that card's mana cost and it's a three four i think this card is insanely powerful like untapping with this card in you know i guess maybe not permission based control decks because of the symmetrical nature of spells can't be countered but in just you know any deck that's getting most of its advantage out of its instants and sorceries you know if you're at like seven or eight mana and you slam this card it's immediately going to like torrential gear hulk something back uh you can like cast your doom blade or whatever or if you like get to untap with it now suddenly your hand is every instant of sorcery you've cast this game uh at the same mana cost and your hand and you've got like you know at least the five mana you just spent up you can do like two or three things in a turn it's a card that can single-handedly turn the tides uh, if it's not answered. Um, and I just think it's really powerful alongside a lot of, like, uh, you know, the more premium one-for-one -one interactive spells that, you know, you just tend to want to play and construct it anyway. Uh, I'd like to apologize for Stormseeker from 20 minutes ago being brutally assaulted on the podcast and then Disciple being brought up. No, I'm just kidding. I, this card, <laughs> this card, uh, I think, is really interesting. I, I don't know how like this is one of those things where it's like this card requires you to build your deck in such a way and has a lot of different pieces that you could be playing with it like this card works really well with Ren and seven in a lot of ways right like Ren puts the cards in the graveyard gets you the extra land so that you can play this and have mana to do something when you play uh Lear on the same turn so this card's really interesting to me it's one of those things where like I kind of read it and just no cap just was like yeah I'm gonna check out from this one like I just don't have like the brain to figure that out uh there's nothing too obvious or too abusable and that i could think of and so it's kind of like well someone else will kind of figure that stuff out and we'll see how it plays out but it definitely reads like a very very strong card that could totally you know take over a game yeah i think also it's important to say that like while it is a bit of a non-bow with like the permission spells you could still play this in a deck with those same permission spells and just say that like at the stage of the game where i have leer like i'm gonna I'm going to use everything else. I don't really need, like, my cancel if I'm going to be able to cast every Doomblade in my graveyard, you know? So, I don't know if Spencer has any opinions uh, before I move on to the next one. I think that this is probably a sideboard card that is going to annoy the crap out of me. Um... But your things can't be countered. Perfect for it. <laughs> That's fair. I, 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 I don't know. Why are you poo pooing on this, Mason? Uh, it's a five mana card that does nothing at the start, so I think it is has a pretty. It's high a seven barrier. mana card that does something immediately. <laughs> I think it has a high barrier to expand. Your I, mind. Yeah, I think this is. <laughs> I I think that this is likely just a sideboard card for either control mirrors or for like Delver style decks against control decks, even where like uh I don't know it. it I, I would, I'm not going to lie. I would be surprised if this card's all play. I have a question for you. And these, oh, I'm not trying to do a whole thing. You know, you're new on the show here, back again, I should say. We're trying. No, brand new. I've never uh, done this before. So ne Yeah, never been here. Uh, and I don't want to put a rivalry so early into things. Uh, that's why I'm making up me and Abe and not about me and you. Uh, would you say this card is better or worse than <laughs> Stormseeker, for example? <laughs> like a 3-3 three, three for 3 with haste. That uh, gives other creatures hate. Just like out of curiosity, like not that two cards should be compared like that. I'm an equal opportunity employer. Tell me but, about uh, tell me about your this. next hit, Abe. Uh, that's My next hit is considered. 
which is a single blue instant. You uh, look top card of your library, you may put that card in your graveyard, and then you draw a card. It's like opt, but better, because, well, in most contexts, better, because you get to put the card in your graveyard. Funnily uh, enough, not even... better with Delver. <laughs> I mean, sometimes, what? like, Scry can be better if you're, like, really worried about... You have, like, one card you can't afford to mill, you know? But... Well, yeah, Opt also doesn't work with Delver, right? Like, you just draw the card? Yeah. Oh, I guess that's true. Yeah, in both cases, you're not... Good, good call-out, Mason. Good call-out, Mason. It's just the better version. <laughs> it works better yeah, with your five-mana card, too. You better with your Merc Tide reading. Yeah, there we go. It's better with everything. Better with Our... your Snapcaster Mages... Because you fuel your further Snapcaster mages. Yeah, I'm gonna tell you about tell you about this card called that you're Thought all Scour. Be a ton of. Yeah. yeah, I mean this is great for Historic Phoenix, and this is great for like if your modern deck played Opt, it most likely would prefer to have this. Like, like you, a lot of Opt decks are also Snapcaster decks. So. You don't need this for Historic Phoenix. Just wait for the next Arena update. You'll just get to play Brainstorm for a few hours and just like siphon people of their money and their time. Yes. And... And then Perfect. wizards wizards won't do anything about it, and Spencer will rage on Twitter. Anyway, uh, <laughs> I think that this card's sweet. Like this is this was uh, this was close to one of my hits, also. Yeah, card's great. Yeah, so. yeah. I think that you know having a one mana cantrip in standard, good thing to have. A little bit of smoothing for the blue players because they really need it. And uh, yeah, I, I do easy, think it's yeah easy layup. I do think that it's interesting that. There is so there's been so many good like blue card filter draw effects. Like it's gonna be interesting where this card fits in to different decks. Like you've got so many that now it's kind of deck specific, right? Like when you looked at other things, it was less deck specific when you would pick cards like this. And now I think that we've gotten to the point where we have enough like this this total amount, not just in standard, by the way, I'm talking about historic too. Where like you know, picking the right card for the right deck becomes more of a real thing. Great, Spencer. We talked about one of your hits already, unfortunately. But what is your last hit? Yeah. So my last hit is the uh, full art basic lands. Um, you know, these things are gorgeous. It was uh, great having Spencer as a host of the show <laughs> for a whole episode. You know, uh, wow, it was great. I hope you can cast survival this great. And, uh, <laughs> time only as well. I'll see you later, Spencer. Um, any, any other words you want to say before you talk about your full art land some more? <laughs> Mason won't let me do it. Uh, no, I, I think... They're not a hit. They don't I, impact constructed. <laughs> dude, they impact my constructed game. I'm... I just bought those Nyx lands, man. I got to replace them all now with these hotness. Uh, yeah, my last hit is actually Delver of Secrets. And the reason that I wanted to talk about this card is because I think people only remember the first half of Delver's life cycle in Standard and don't actually remember that it saw zero play its second year in Standard. And I think there are a few things. There's there's a really good unsummon in this set for what it's worth that I think is going to be really helpful for, for cards like Delver. Um, but also just like... The fact that I think that red is probably the more correct color pair for Delver just in general. Like, if you look at, like, you know, blue-red Delver in Legacy, team or Delver in Legacy, um, you know, obviously that hasn't been the case in... Uh, no, even in even in Popper, you know, there was a blue-red Delver deck. Uh, like, I, it's just kind of the thing that's better to do. And I think the spells right now... If you want to, you know, they've had so many spell sub themes for blue red, um, and then the addition of those, those, you know, spell lands and things like that. Delver is positioned to actually be able to be a relevant card in standard with this printing, whereas, you know, even though it's you know one of the best creatures ever printed, it it needs support. Like it can't, you can't just put Delver in a deck and and you know have it be good. It 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 takes a lot. Um, and I actually think that we are in a position where we might actually have hit the critical mass of things to make this one work. I really hate how negative I've been today <laughs> about our hits. You know, uh, it's not my fault that uh, maybe some people set the mood with my good friend Stormseeker like that. <laughs> <laughs> and with that being said, uh, I 
believe it is possible for a Delver deck to be assembled that can flip Delver pretty consistently in two turns in Standard. And beyond that, I don't know what else to think. But I think it is doable thanks to the Zendikar lands. Um, and I think it matters so much on if the red decks are playable. I think, like, the red low-to-the-ground aggressive decks, I think Delver really has a hard time kind of being something in Standard. But I think there's a very easier world where that's not the case. And I think Delver does much better when there are, you know, less things happening on turn one and two. So, uh, from the opponent's side of the table. So, yeah, I, I think Delver... It is a card that you do need to give respect. It has that pedigree. And it does, it isn't a card that does it all on its own, like Ragavan or, you know, DRC in some ways. You need to have that sort of help, but we do have that help between, you know, Expressive Iteration being such a powerful card you want to play and the lands and, you know, things like uh, Frostbite being in the format really help Delver. So, yeah. And even though they do answer it, <laughs> I, I, no, it's true. And like, I, I think that, you know, I don't know. I don't. I don't know that. Like, as you know, to use uh, the the great expression that AB is like. I don't even know that there's egg on my face if like this doesn't pan out. But there are so many good cheap uh, instants and sorceries, and also you know we we already talked about the the vampire that you know does those snapcaster impressions. We you know the snow the snow cards are all like super undercosted for what they do. I don't know. I, I think that there's like a real chance that there's enough support. That doesn't mean there will be enough support and that it won't be pushed out of the format. That's not what I'm saying. Like the it 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 takes a lot for Delver to amass what it needs. So Yeah, I mean when Delver was dominant, right, it was backed up by Taxing Probe, Ponder uh vapor snag snapcaster mage mana lake all cards that are just like so and like geist the saint trapped at its best it was like trainer's pike yeah it just had some of the most messed up cards that could possibly be assembled together in a blue tempo deck uh in a format that was not at all prepared for it, it had like gut shot was really good for him like the mana dork decks it played with all the snapcast mage there were a ton of things going on there were still fringe strategies that played delver of secrets after all of those like the the really miracle that miracle grow blue well I, that was in the same form the miracle grow uh blue green uh yeah, that deck was Korean sick triad yeah deck yeah and there's you know like anytime there's a creature that efficient if you can jump through the hoop of having enough hits to to make it into a good card then it's you know gonna have a chance to be a good card and as things shake out it's definitely a card I wouldn't overlook and and a card I would expect to like. Do do a little bit of damage. It's uh, it, yeah. I, I think I think it like maybe this time around it'll be kind of less polarized. We won't get to see it at dominant and then see it at like which, which I don't think I don't actually think magic is, but, but I think that it can it can totally have a place in this format for sure. I, I don't yeah. disagree with you there. I I also don't think that magic is in a good place when decks like Delver are the best decks. I think that's yeah. actually not fun. So I think that they've done a really good job of saying like. You can play Delver of Secrets. Like, it's, like, and you can have those games where, like, it's not like we're not playing against Delver of Secrets right now in Standard, right? Like, have you ever played against a turn one freaking rogue that mills you two, and then they play another one that mills you four, and then all of a sudden they have freaking Counterspell Doomblade yeah, Split card? Like, really that is just straight up Delver. Like, the, like the number, all of the games I've lost to rogues are from their Delver draw. Like, that, it's just true. Um... But like Mason said, like it, it really does come down to what are the pressures on the format? Um, because I, I think there's the support, but it, it is about what just because just because there's support for a tempo deck does not mean that tempo decks are necessarily great. Like there's been lots of blue red mono blue tempo decks over the last five years that you know some of them have been good, some of them you should not have played. So. Well, hopefully y'all enjoyed this pick to set review of Innistrad Midnight Hunt. It'll be coming out to you very soon in Arena and at your LGS for pre-release and all of that good stuff. You can find Spencer on Twitter at Spencer13H. Uh, and then you can also find Abe at More No Things on Twitter and find me at Mason E. Clark. Thank you all so much for hanging out with us tonight and listening to this episode. We'll see y'all next week for our first impressions of Midnight Hunt 
It's going to be a doozy. We'll see y'all then. Yeah, that, that blue card is much worse than that red card. I cannot believe that. That was a question on this podcast. Yeah!